Ah, we're back, we're live, it's the four o'clock rock, well, a few minutes after four, mm -hmm. and this is our flagship energy show, Hawaii, the state of clean energy, we've been doing for, gee, three, four years now, and it really is wonderful. And we have, uh, of course, our Negawatt moment uh, with Lisa Harmon from Hawaii Energy, and uh, she's here to make a special report on what kind of new things they got going. They always have something new. It's like we an do. endless cornucopia. We do. Yeah. We have a lot of ideas over there. <laughs> yeah, you knew two o'clock in the morning. What do you got now, Lisa? Well, Jay, I want to let you know that Hawaii Energy, in addition to offering incentive funding for people that purchase energy efficient equipment, of course, that's our, our main uh, objective, but we also offer technical trainings to help the workforce of Hawaii increase their skill level. And we are offering a building operator certification. It's September 15th through December 15th is when it's going to be offered. So it's offered in conjunction with the Northwest Energy Efficiency Council and it's delivered in Hawaii by the University of Hawaii Manoa Outreach College. It's classes. It's yes. A, it's a course. It's a series of classes. So it's an eight week series of courses and it focuses on um, all different types of things, HVAC, lighting, controls, things that a building operator um, should know and increase their knowledge of to become more energy efficient in how they run the building. So I had three possible constituencies come to mind. One is the building owner. He mm -hmm. should know this because there's a lot of money involved and his ROI is going to depend on how efficient he is being on his building. Right. Number two is the building manager. You know, this is going to be primarily his job and he needs to understand the, you know, the engineering of his building. And the third, of course, is the engineer himself. The building operator. Who's on, you know, on the firing line, right up there, working the machinery, tuning everything, making sure that whatever best practices are in place, you know, he, or he's like, going to implement those practices. Yes, right? yes. So it's a very tactile type of course, and it's aimed and directed at those building operators and engineers, the people that are actually running the facilities, so they can learn better skills in, like you said, running the equipment and, and making the building more energy efficient. You know, it's a moving target, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, on the mainland, you know, they talk about it a lot. They, 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 they do a lot of this, and Building Owners Association, NIOP also, all those real estate organizations that are involved in managing you know big properties right um, and we don't necessarily get that here we've got to get it here and we've got to be just as good as they are on the mainland we've got to be trained education is everything it's so easy to slough off and and do and do what we did before that's instead right. of what they do now that's right well and that's why we're offering this training so it's a great subsidy as well this is a, a sixteen hundred dollar course and hawaii energy is subsidizing fourteen hundred dollars of the cost of that so the copay for the participant is only two hundred dollars wow yeah Wow. Awesome deal. I mean, this is this would be really attractive. I have a feeling you're going to fill up the room on this one. We are. It's going to fill up quickly. So we need all the applications by August 18th because registration closes on August 26th. So anybody that's interested, if they could go to outreach.hawaii.edu backslash BOC. This and they can find all the information. Very there. good. Very good program. But it's one of those two o'clock. I know you guys. You always. <laughs> That's uh, when we got the idea at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> of course, good. <laughs> but I mean, not only is it good for you, it's good for Outreach College, and it's of certainly course. good for the building owners, managers, and engineers uh, in our community um, who really have to, you know, be at the front end. I mean, we have, we have a lot of energy efficiency in, in other parts of the, of the community, but we need it in big buildings, commercial buildings, mm -hmm. office buildings, retail, mm -hmm. big retail, and that's what you're going to reach. And I think there will be a, a, a measurable result here when they get to know the best practices you're bringing from the mainland. Exactly, right? exactly. And they have focused courses that cover, again, a variety of topics, be it building controls or they are, their HVAC system, their pumps and their motors. And think of all the office buildings that are here, the AOAO condominium properties. Some of those those are quite oh, large. Thought of that. That's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. And they have there the big 18,000 condominiums in the yep. state of Hawaii, and they're all, you know, potentially your clientele on this program. That's right. That's You're going right. to offer it more than once? Um, yeah, probably again after January in the next calendar year, but um, we just started our new program year on July 1st, so this is one of our first kickoff training events. It's a winner. It's happening. Yeah. It's a winner. We're very excited. Lisa Harmon, Hawaii Energy, doing fabulous things. Thank you so Great. much. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to see you, Jay. Aloha. Come back soon. Come back okay. next week. Okay. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> Aloha everyone, I'm Maria Mera and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show Viva Hawaii every other Monday at 3 p.m. Um, we are here to show you news, issues and events local and around the world. Join me. 
Hey everybody, my name is David Chang and I am a new host for the show, The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to share with you how to get the smart edge in life. We're going to have awesome guests in the military, business, political, nonprofit world. So no matter what background you're from, we have something for you. Please join us every other Thursday at 10 a.m. at thinktechhawaii.com or on theartofthinkingsmart.com. I look forward to seeing you. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Start your Pauhana weekend off with the show where I talk to people about issues pertinent to Hawaii. You can see my previous shows at my blog, kawilucas.com, and also on Think Tech's show. Sorry. Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying $5 billion a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green, aloha, and thank you very much. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, meeting people we may have not otherwise met, helping us understand and appreciate the good things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here. I know you're bored this summer. You're just sitting at home, figuring out what to do, go to the beach, spend some time with ThinkTech Hawaii. Spend the time thinking about how you can contribute to Hawaii and make it a better place to live. And start watching some of the programs on ThinkTech, including Stan the Energy Man, where you'll learn all about everything energy, especially hydrogen and transportation. So we'll see you every Friday at 12 o'clock noon. Stan the Energy Man here on ThinkTech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha everybody, my name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Chantal Seville, host of the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii, and I'm going on tour. I'm taking you around the world. We're going to Canada, and then we're going to, well, we're in America, then we're going to San Francisco. So keep staying tuned, 11 a.m. every Wednesday on the Savvy Chick Show. We'll see you next time. Bingo, we're back. You, I told you we're coming back, and we came back, but something's different. What's different? Melissa Pavlicek is here, and that's the Hawaii Procurement Institute. And guess what? Next to her, one of my favorite people in the world. Oh, gosh. Okay? Mm -hmm. Rachel James, <laughs> uh, not only from the Hawaii uh, Procurement Institute, but also from, from uh, Stan Osserman's office, HCAT. Yes. Okay, on Cook Street. Okay? And a guy that I knew and loved back about, what, 15 years ago? In okay. his, his other life, his, his previous life as a representative from Maui, uh, under the Lingal administration, you're Republican, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Kiko Bukowski. Thanks. Thank, Thank you all for coming down. Lovely to have you here together. Now, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about procurement. Government contracting is a hot topic, particularly in the energy sector. And I'm hoping that Kika can share with us some lessons learned and information from the construction sector. Uh, he served yeah. on the state procurement task force, and that's something we watch closely and have a few issues to talk about there. And Rachel has been serving as an extern with the Hawaii Procurement Institute, so I'm hoping she can help us illuminate some issues as well. Okay. Yeah, extern is different than an intern. Indeed. Right? Yeah, extern, you, you're outside, but you come in. An intern, you're inside, but maybe you go out, you're not sure. Oh, no. Externs get credits. Interns oh, are just... Oh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> it's much more experience. realistic. It's much more yes. practical. Okay. <laughs> Kika, uh, so, you know, I really like the idea of bringing n knowledge and, um, you know, and, and best practices in from the community, business community, into government and into certainly energy, which is a sort of a community of everyone, government and everyone. Um, so what would you offer from your vantage on how energy can better use the magic of procurement? 
Well, I think uh, in the last legislative session, there were some bills that were being considered. One, I think what, what might uh, be interesting to the energy sector is the uh, um, special innovative procurement. I know that was an item of discussion. Private public is that an oxymoron? Uh, you know. Innovative <laughs> procurement. <Yeah. laughs> well, How do you make was, procurement innovative? It, it was trying to think a little bit out of the box, um, more towards your uh, public-private partnerships, P3s, um, which I, I, I think um, energy projects might fit more in. Uh, so those were items of discussion in the last session. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think right. one of the goals and why, why we wanted, the Procurement Institute wanted to come and talk energy with you is that we want to foster innovation. We want to use the tools that are already in the existing procurement code, but we support some of the initiatives that Sarah Allen at the State Procurement Office has made to educate procurement officers and the private sector about the tools already in the procurement code. And I think one of the things that Kika worked on, you know, just as a former legislator and on the procurement task force is trying to get that engagement with the community and get some good conversations around what changing the procurement code would do or should we keep it the same? Yeah, okay, there's a question. You know, I mean, there are people out there in the community, I, 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 it's not gonna surprise you too much, who don't like the procurement code. Uh, or there are people who think it works better on a county level than it does on a state level well, or on the federal level. One reason why they think it doesn't work well is there are a number of exemptions in it. And so sometimes when you see more procurements going under the exemptions than in the actual code, you kind of like wonder what's going on. And, and I think Rachel works in a program that actually manages some of the exempt procurements very well. So I think there's, you know, arguments on both sides. But Rachel? Is it fair? Is it fair? Um, I think particularly in a time when technology is advancing faster than legislation can keep up, um, exemptions definitely serve a purpose. But I can see how some would feel that that just throws the code right out the window. So I put this to all three of you. Do, you, do we need a change in the procurement code? I think you said no last week. <laughs> I think, I mean, my overall outlook in the Hawaii Procurement Institute is the procurement code itself has a lot of opportunity and vehicles for government contracting officers to use, and it's not necessary to be constantly changing it. Can it be tweaked here and there? I'm sure there are bills that we might see in the future that we could support. You know the problem support. with Pandora's box. Right. You, you tweak here and boop, the whole thing gets tweaked. Right. So I think businesses need certainty and we definitely want to see clarity and certainty. And I think for construction contracts, that's one of the primary goals. So um, I, I think um, the special innovative procurement um, initiative that was uh, discussed in the last session was a, a, an attempt to try to be a little bit more flexible uh, to address some of the uh, uh, projects that are a little outside the box, but yet kind of keep it within the procurement process. Uh, you know, I, I, I would tend to agree with, with, with Melissa as far as uh, the procurement code, you know, having a lot of options out there, not necessarily all of them used. I think we're starting to see a little bit more uh, of some of the prog uh, uh, processes used. I think uh, we're starting to see multiple, uh, the two-step process being used by the D DOE uh, in, in response to some of the bids coming in for the heat abatement, which drew some attention recently. So. But all in all, I think the, the, the procurement process is good. I, I think the task force was, was a, a, a tremendous uh, opportunity for various stakeholders to come to the table, although that particular task force was pretty much geared towards construction. Um, I, I think it's something that should be continued. Uh, I believe it sunsetted June 30th of this year was, was the sunset. What does that mean? Um, it, it dissolved. Um, okay. So we, we were brought together for a specific purpose. Um, and we actually, it was extended to discuss past performance, but we never quite got off the ground. What, what strikes me though is, uh, you know, I'm just being Mr. John Q. Public here, um, that the procurement code causes bureaucracy and slowdown, okay, on the one side. The other side is that uh, there, there's rules and whatnot, and you get to, you know, go down the path and it's hard and some people don't feel it's fair and maybe it's because they don't know it very well um, and at the end of the day um, on construction projects and on energy especially at least as far as this show is concerned we have to move quickly we have to move definitively we have to move in a fair manner everybody gets a shot at it and we have to avoid controversy okay what do we need to do to achieve those things 
Well, I kind of smiled when you said that it's you know slow and difficult and all of that because the minute that we get a bad you. That's procurement. That's what it's all about here on Think Tank. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you for the permission. I I think that the procurement code is set up to ensure that we have fairness, transparency, and it can be much more quick if we do it right. And so I think How a lot of right? you know training, having so good this procurement, program that so you that have sunsetted. That's, actually, that's part of training, isn't it? No, actually, I think the More. procurement task force was set up to address prompt payment initially. Oh. So that's another aspect, and I think a key I mean, The state thing doesn't always pay its bills We promptly. haven't talked about yet is this whole, what is procurement? Is it just the putting out of an RFP and awarding it? No, I think the Hawaii Procurement Institute, we look at procurement, and so does the state procurement office as the entire spectrum from coming up with an idea, the budget, all the way to completing the project. So the, the entire management of the project. And so- The engagement um, with the government. That's absolutely. The, the whole thing. Yeah, from beginning we, need, to end. we need clarity, transparency, well, quickness, and, and speed, innovation, training. all of People that. People have training, to be up how close to do on this. this. They have to yeah. talk to each other about it. They have to learn the best ways. And then you know they won't be they won't be surprised and they'll have a better experience and they won't go and bad mouth the, the, the procurement code so much. I wouldn't say bad mouth, but you know, talk stink <laughs> about the procurement get code. Get projects done and get yeah, them get, done. Get projects that done. Again, yes. So how do we train all the people who need to be trained, Rachel? Well, that's what Hawaii Procurement Institute does. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is one answer. But I mean, it's definitely the procurement office is doing that. And there are other organizations, private sector and public sector, that are doing that. But getting back to the task force that Kiko was on, you know, picking these sections of the, the array of the whole procurement process and trying to address any problems with it, that, that's an important solution. Let's talk about the solution. problem of getting paid. Yeah, so that's a problem. I've heard that many times where, you know, you have a contract with the state and you can whistle. I think uh, what, what Melissa is referring to, I think there was a, a bill in 2011 that I think set up a prompt payment task force. Now, that wasn't your bill. No, it wasn't necessarily. I think and you I'm, weren't there. That that you, was you were you you were not in the I was legislature. Not there. I want to be clear about this. Oh yeah, again. he was out of the legislature <laughs> by then. So so then there was subsequent to the prompt payment task force, which ended up focusing primarily on human services right. payments, which is a different right. procurement code. Yeah. We could have and a we're topic not another about day. That today, right. Topic for another day. Yeah. Right. But you do cover that in the procurement institute, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. But we're going to you know but, shave but this down to energy today. Then. Kika's task force took off, the, and then it morphed into this past performance right. task force. So we've had many conversations. I, I think the main force. overriding goal was, was to, to try to understand and to get everybody from various uh, areas uh, that, that touch procurements, if affected by procurement from the business sector, from the agencies, various agencies. Um, what, what, what we've done actually with our procurement is we've actually um, decentralized it. So each agency actually has their own chief procurement officer. There's been some discussion to maybe try to consolidate that and bring it back I've under the I've heard that actually on the show earlier today, yeah. that there's different practices in different agencies. And as a result, you have to be skilled in how each one operates. And I, I don't it would think, be better uh, if they were running on the same uniform basis. Yeah. Huh? I don't know. I mean, I don't think that's intentional. But what, what one of the things that came out of the task force is that it was identified that there are some inconsistencies on how one agency might interpret the same procurement so code how do you from fix another. That? Get together and talk and try to come up with a consistent need maybe a bill? possibly consult. I don't think you need a bill. I think it's just talking story, keeping such task force open uh, so you have that collaboration and, and getting everybody on the same page. And I think that's what the uh, state procurement officer uh, office is are trying they on, to. They're on board they're, with this? They're attempting to do. As they're they're the other side of this discussion. I mean, you guys yes. are the... Uh, the, what do you call it? The where the rubber hits the road. Yeah, you you see both sides. Yeah, you're kind of in the middle of it. I guess, you know, between the people bidding and the people who take take the bids, <coughs> take the bids. <coughs> but uh, you, you got to have everybody on board in order to make an improvement. Absolutely, and I think um, finding ways to get on the same page or understand what the procurement says and what can be allowed. So I know Rachel and I were recently at a program where we talked about cost and pricing and what is allowed, what can be charged on a change order, how much flexibility uh, the government contracting officers have, and that's really important to understand yeah. to make sure the procurement. So Rachel, you know, yes. you, you've been listening to these guys and uh, the, our colloquy here, that's a law, law, a law firm kind mm -hmm. of word, uh, it means conversation. <clears throat> uh, so how much of what Melissa has said and Kika has said do you agree with? Um, I agree with much of it. 
I couldn't let's, let's point to something. Parts. No, I mean, I wouldn't point to anything that I disagree with, <laughs> but I think in a very basic way, I, just in the public engagement with government programs and processes is a space where there can be a, a great deal of education. I mean, there's great opportunity for people to learn more on both sides, um, and procurement is one of them because it touches so many different industries and agencies and companies and, um, I mean, even just departments throughout the state government. Um, so there's definitely a great space of education and having conversations and task forces and having institutes that promote workshops and provide opportunities for contracting officers and contractors to, to have a conversation and to collaborate, um, I think that's important. So I feel like that's what both of you have been saying. So. Yeah. One of the reasons why I thought it would be so great to include Rachel in this conversation is she does wear another hat and you mentioned it earlier um, on her other work with HCAT and I think there's a lot of opportunities to intersect and to bring the energy certainly at the intersection of energy yeah. and uh, procurement so what what does HCAT do just take one one organization it's a part of uh, HTDC which is yes. a, 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 a DBED um, attached agency to DBED yes uh, where does uh, procurement fit in its world so it's interesting um, HCAT is actually exempted and um, well HTDC has many exemptions and so much of our work is covered under the exemptions that HTDC has um, primarily because it's a high-tech development corporation and so we're meant to move quickly um, and oftentimes because of the work that we do is research and development sometimes you don't necessarily have to get it right at the end it's going through a process and understanding something that you didn't recognize in the beginning of the process um, and that's something that I think the procurement code um, can address and there are elements within the existing code that can address that but I mean it's buried and to have someone knowledgeable about that um, I don't know that they're everywhere. So if we can broaden that. Yeah. You Just know, a point of curiosity, how many pages long is the procurement code? Uh, That's a good question. We'll bring you the book, okay? We'll bring you the code you need section. A truck, huh? Yeah, no, it, it, absolutely not. It's a section of the Hawaii Revised Statutes. It's yeah. not a volume. So, so Jay, I, I wanted to kind of um, back up a little bit. Uh, you know, there's there's a couple school of thoughts. You know, there's there's some there's a school of thought that says, well, they want it a little bit more expedient, a little bit more streamlined, more flexible ability to move quickly. And then there's the other school of thought that says, well, you know, if if we're too if we're too loose, then it might it might allow for some improprieties, some uh, unfair treatment, some subjectivity. Uh, and what we're really talking about here um, is is the use of public funds, public taxpayer dollars. And we have to make sure that those taxpayer dollars are used in the most efficient, effective, fair, objective uh, manner possible. Yeah, yeah. So I guess, you know, um, I come from the construction industry uh, as far as representation on the task force. And, and there's some concern there that, you know, we don't necessarily want to um, uh, throw out the process in, in, in exchange for expediency. Because sometimes you have to find a balance if, if, there's, if, you, if you exempt too much from the procurement process, then you may open it up for improprieties and, and unfair uh, use of taxpayer dollars. Uh, and, and we've seen some of that abuse of the procurement code. That's why I'd like to, and Rachel and I were talking earlier about less is more in terms of exemptions. And even for, there are um, exemptions in the code where certain agencies still have to follow a procurement code-like process, even mm -hmm. if they are exempt. Yeah. So you still want transparency, accountability, and competition. And, and, and my understanding is the special innovative procurement uh, process that was being discussed in last session was uh, uh, an attempt to provide that flexibility and the ability to move a little quicker, but still keep it within the, the confines of a, of a process. Yeah. yeah. I want to uh, just uh, uh, digress on the point of quicker for a minute. Um, you know, I've been studying you know, bureaucracy and, and slowness in state government and city government for that matter. And I've come to a conclusion that we could move faster. This is not gonna surprise you, but how can we move faster? Well, I think if, if we train them and we say, look, you're in a mission critical place. And if you let that application document, you know, permission languish on your in, in your in basket for a month, you're doing everyone a disservice. You can't do that. You have to, you know, have to have alacrity in the way you deal with the paper that crosses your desk. It's not excusable that you let it sit there for a month or two or three or four. <clears throat> what do you think about that? I it's okay. You can speak <laughs> candidly. <laughs> Nobody's listening. <laughs> Honestly, one thing I think is that 
the government contracting officers, we need to recognize their role as acquisition professionals. We need to recognize the time, the skill, the investment in learning. Is a month that, acceptable? No. <laughs> There's a lot of training that goes involved, and they are constantly upgrading their skills. And I'm very encouraged by what's happening at the state procurement office in terms of training the professionals who are there. they got to so, be trained, too. Absolutely. So you guys can form you know, work uh, task forces, and you can do like what Hawaii Energy to told us they were doing. They get together with the Outreach College Engineering, and they have a, a three- or four-month program where they, you can come in for cheap and you know, get a very detailed discussion of uh, exactly you know, the building, building engineering issues in that case. But you could do the same thing with procurement. And and, so, but I don't think it's somebody sitting on a piece of paper or it's at the bottom of their stack. I think mm -hmm. one of the things people point to in terms of slow is the protest process. And I know um, the protest process is there for a reason to ensure that the procurements are done correctly and that the awards are made properly, that the, art, the request for proposals are written well. And well, I think so we, have to, we have to treat protests very carefully because, after all, this is Hawaii nay, the state of protest. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I think that the state of protest... So it's not the state of you're protest. Letting me, you're letting me contradict you today, and I'm <laughs> taking every opportunity to do so. I but want I think, you to do that, Melissa. I think that there's a perception that we sh maybe we shouldn't protest or that we might have a black mark against us if we do protest. Just delay. And that's not... Or just delay. But the protest process is part of the procurement code, and so I don't think we need to be afraid of See, that. The thing is, if I'm a contractor and I protest, so I'm slowing the other guy down now for a while. Next time around, he's going to slow me down. So the result is we all slow each other down. Hopefully, the next time around, I'm not saying every protest is bad. Basis. I think that contractors should go into this fully educated about the implications of a protest. It's not just their silo; it's the whole system is, is being affected by what they do. Yeah, I, I, I think protests is a, is a big issue with construction and, and procurement, and, I, and, and there's discussions every session about how to address some of the more um, the issues that don't, wouldn't necessarily affect the bid, uh, but that could be maybe um, uh, allowed to be uh, corrected either prior to bid award or, or uh, that type of thing. Okay, Kiko, we're about out of time, but I want to offer you the opportunity uh, to take, take that camera over there, number one. Okay. and tell them uh, all the ways in which you think I am wrong about all this. <laughs> no, I, I, 30 seconds. You know, I, I, think, I think, as I think I mentioned earlier, I think it's really important to continue the, the discussion uh, with uh, organizations like the Hawaii Procurement Institute and uh, engaging not just the state agencies, but uh, the, the stakeholders as well, uh, the contractors, the, the organizations that actually uh, go through the procurement process. I think it's really important, um, and I know that the state procurement office is, is attempting to do that right now, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. Thank you, Kika. Kiku Bukowski. Rachel James, Oh, could you tell the people <laughs> all the ways in which you think I am wrong? Um, I actually don't think that you're wrong, Jay, but Thank you, um, Rachel. you're welcome. We get along good. Thanks for having me on. No, <laughs> um, no I think it, education is important, and, um, and for people to make informed decisions, they need to have the information. Um, and so if we can facilitate more opportunities to people, for people to have that information, um, I think that's a positive thing. And the State Procurement Office and HPI and people like Kika involved in tax forces, we're doing those things. So it's looking up. Okay, Melissa. I, I've already told you where I think you're wrong. But oh, a thing, different question for oh. you. Uh, how much of what Rachel and Kika have said do you agree with? Everything they said. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I did want to say one last thing, Look and that that's HPI one. is um, funding some uh, internships, and so we're going to get some government contracting interns placed with government contracting offices. Excellent idea. There are so many possibilities. This is a good time. You guys are in the right place, doing the right thing, in the right way, at the right time. Who said that? Thank you, everybody. Kika, Rachel, Melissa, thanks for coming out. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Aloha.